Okay. Uh, we're going to get back into things now. Uh, we have two presentations left to, to wrap up things this afternoon now that we're after lunchtime. Uh, assistant Coach Ben Hoffman is going to go over things next. Uh, ben right now is, is working with our men's and women's golf team. Uh, he's also working with uh, one of our major assistants with our, with our football team here. And then uh, working with our softball team. Am I missing him? I think that's it. Um, and so Ben's got a pretty good background. I'll let him introduce himself a little bit here. And then I'm excited to hear his presentation about the Olympic Clips. Thanks, Coach Raz. Uh, like you said, I'm Ben Hoffman. And uh, started my first year here at Fletcher College since January. I'm um, from South Austin State and the University of Houston before that. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I uh, grew up playing soccer and played college soccer just uh, north of Austin, Texas. So that's kind of my background. I'm uh, going to be talking about Olympic lifting for sports. And it's kind of an interesting situation because Olympic lifting or weightlifting, as you might call it, um, is a sport in and of itself. And we as strength coaches often use it to train our athletes. So we're using another sport to train our own sports. Um, but they're very effective tools to have in our uh, coaching uh, toolbox. And I'm going to go over some of the benefits for that. Okay. Um, I'm going to just go over the lifts at first. Uh, review what they are and kind of give a background on that kind of thing. Rationale for using them, why why we use them as strength coaches, um, what's the reason of using these lifts to develop uh, better performance. Review teaching progressions, so going over how we actually teach these lifts because they are very technical. Uh, it's not like you can just have an athlete jump up to the bar and perform a snatch uh, right off the bat. It's going to be very difficult to do. Uh, and then at the very end, go over some common errors, because uh, they are so technical, you can see these errors and how to deal with those. Uh, contraindications for certain athletes, such as uh, baseball players, and substitutions that you could use for those athletes. Alright, so there's two Olympic lifts. There's the clean and jerk and the snatch. The clean and jerk is a two-stage lift, because there are two portions of the lift. They will, uh, the athlete cleans it from the floor to a front squat position. To where they're wrapped on the shoulders, and then that athlete cleans or jerks it above the head to where they're in an overhead position. The snatch is a one stage lift because they've been lifted directly from the floor to an overhead position. And on the next slide, you'll see a diagram of this. So on the top here is the snatch, obviously. As you can see, there's one stage here with the recovery. That bar is lifted directly overhead, caught in an overhead squat position and then stood up there, and that's just the recovery, so it's pretty much just a one-stage lift. Whereas with the clean here on the second row, it is lifted to the shoulders, caught in a front squat position. The recovery from that front squat can stand up, and it's a dip and drive into the jerk. Right here, usually caught in a split position, like so, they'll have the recovery, or so I should say like so, and have the recovery standing straight up to where you are at this last portion. So snatch, one stage lift, clean and jerk, two stage lift. And these are the two exercises that they have in weightlifting competitions such as the Olympics. All right, so now going just into the movements itself. Snatch and the clean are pretty much the same movement uh, up into the front squat or the overhead catch um, as far as biomechanics go. So I'm going to use these for both lifts here. And this diagram just shows the sequence. You have the starting position, this first uh, picture right here. Uh, lining up to the bar, bar still, or weight still on the ground. And notice he has a flat, flat, flat back, shoulders are right over the bar. So that's the basic starting position. And the lift off is pretty much where that weight breaks from the floor, going up into just below the knees. So it's probably around these three pictures right here, showing that weight coming up off the ground. Next part in the sequence is the passing of the knees. Pretty important part, uh, one of the more technical parts of the lift. And this is where, coming from that lift off, that bar passing the knees, and then that's where actually the second pull happens, and that's where the true power of this uh, exercise is generated. Uh, the extension, where that power is, is where you're getting that big extension, pushing that force down to the ground, propelling that weight up. Once you have done that, pulling down under the bar. So right here, you see he's at full extension, and he has to pull himself down under the bar. That's where he pulls under, catches the weight, and stands up over it. Right. So the jerk is a little bit different. 
obviously you're starting in that front squat, uh, front squat position or front rack position here. Bars on the shoulders, not in the hands, and that's going to allow you to dip and drive the weight uh, further. So we have the start position, dip and drive, and she down here shows us the dip. Notice she's dipping down, uh, much like Elliot was talking about in his presentation, using that stretch shortening cycle to uh, generate more force. So you have the dip and the drive, and you catch in a split stance. Both pictures here showing that, and the recovery. So it's just the most common way to catch um, in the jerk is with the split stance, and I just mean here, kind of like in a partial lunge position, and you'll step up um, and recover the weight. All right. The clean, uh, many possible variations, um, and you can combine some of these variations, but they're power clean. So well, let me go back a step first. With the full clean, separating it from the jerk, um, a full clean is where you clean it off the ground, catching it way at the bottom here, and then standing up from that position. Now, a power clean, you're going to be catching it the same way, except you're above parallel. So what I mean by parallel is in that squat position, thigh is parallel to the ground or above. That would qualify as a power clean. And it can be a hang power clean, a block power clean, anything of that nature. But just where you catch that bar kind of indicates that. And it's called power clean because the power output tends to be higher in those uh, movements. Hang cleans, and this is where you're supporting the weight in your hands rather than lifting it from the floor. So it could be starting from the power position, which I'll get into later here, hanging from right above the knee, even below the knee, just anywhere where that weight is not in contact with the ground. Uh, counts as a hang clean. Like I said, it could be a hang power clean. It could be a uh, hang from below the knee. All kinds of variations. Uh, block cleans, like this picture here, this athlete has lifted it off blocks. These are those boxes that you see on either side. And that just makes it a dead stop, much like from the ground, but changes the uh, location of that bar. So uh, there's several reasons you might be using blocks, whether it's for uh, working rate of force development from a different position. Definitely uh, utilized in Olympic lifting training a lot. Uh, it could also be used for taller athletes, which I'll suggest um, when we get to some of the errors and corrections that you can do. Also, split claims. This is just where you're catching in a split position. It might be, it used to be used a lot more back in the history of weightlifting, but it might be used for somebody with limited mobility. Um, say they're not able to sit all the way down in a front squat have a lot easier time catching here, and they can stand up with it and go into the jerk or whatever, um, whatever movement you might have them do. Uh, could also help develop eccentric strength and uh, separate legs at a time. Uh, you can make the argument that many sports are played on uh, individual legs, one leg, much like running, uh, double leg. They're not always in this position on the field, but they're often, often running, often doing lunging type movements. So that might be an argument there. All right, the jerk. Many uh, variations here as well. Picture uh, showing an athlete performing the squat jerk. And it's just where he's not catching it in a uh, split position. Power jerk would be the same thing, just not sitting as well. Behind the neck jerk, uh, we haven't didn't show you a start position. Well, yes, uh, where most jerks are here, starting in that front rack position. Power jerk, or behind the neck jerk, you're starting in a back squat, back rack position, dipping and driving, and finishing overhead. You can do jerks with dumbbells and all kinds of other implements, kettlebells. Uh, kind of your options are endless, but those are some of the major ones. And the snatch, pretty much the same as the clean as far as the variations go. You have your power variations, you have your hang variations, uh, you can go from the blocks. And split snatch. Uh, as you can see, this athlete is doing a split snatch right here, sitting very low in the snatch. Um, and what the split snatch, like I said, with the clean with the mobility issues, split snatch allows you to stay more upright. So especially if you have some shoulder issues or uh, maybe a thoracic or hip mobility issue, when you're in an overhead position, it's kind of tough to be sitting straight up. You might fall back. Um, especially if you have a bunch of weight, it's going to be hard to stay completely upright. So if you don't have the ability to get in that correct position, 
it might be tough. And notice he's very upright, and that's allowing him here. You can notice between this and my overhead, I start to go forward a little bit, but here I can stay straight up. So that's kind of the rationale for using the split snatch. So just a few exercises that I think are pretty important um, as foundational exercises and assistance exercises, not an exhaustive list uh, by any means. But uh, squats, front squats, RDLs, overhead squat, military press, I see as foundational exercises because you need to be able to do all of these to be able to do the Olympic lifts. Um, for example, front squat, direct relationship to a clean is actually part of it. And uh, military press, directly related to the jerk. Assistance exercises, I'm not going to go into what all of these are, so if you want to ask me uh, after uh, about any of these, that'd be great. But we have clean pulls, snatch pulls, snatch high pulls, snatch balance, push press, jerk, jerk or deadlift, jerk recovery, and the list goes on. I'm sure uh, some of you can add about 10 or even more to that list. All right, so why, why should we use the Olympic list for training? I'm going to go over the kind of the rationale of why these lifts help out uh, sport performance. Greg Everett, a pretty good Olympic lifting coach, uh, wrote a book, Olympic Lifting for Sport, named these three reasons or general reasons for why to use uh, these lifts for developing uh, power and whatnot in sports. So improve knee, hip extension and power, or knee and hip extension power and the rate of force development. Basically that's increased power. Improve the ability to safely and effectively absorb force uh, or to decelerate, change direction, that kind of thing. And improve kinesthetic awareness, fundamental athletic motor skills, and body control. And basically I take that last one as you make them a better athlete. They're able to control their body and do, you add more to what they're able to do as an athletic person. So getting into the power side of things first, uh, like um, Elliot and Joey both talked about, power is force times velocity, so I won't get into that too much, I kind of learned that already today, but the Olympic lifts are um, highly specific to actual sports because it's they require high amount of force at a relative, or relatively a high amount of force to be developed at fast speeds, so that equals power. Um, just to, to point out where power is, kind of proving that point, it's the force velocity curve here, force on the bottom, velocity on the side, and you notice that max power occurs right here. So it's not at the highest force, not at the highest velocity, it's somewhere in between. That's kind of where the Olympic lifts fall. And the second pull of, the, uh, of these lifts, either the clean or the snatch, have been shown to be very high producing power movements. And this athlete right here performing a snatch is in the middle of her second pull. And that's where that power is produced. Once that once you pass the knee, either the clean or the snatch. Um, and this is compared to traditional power lifting, such as your squats, your bench press, anything of that nature, uh, much higher power outputs. Those are occurring at slow velocities. These are relatively high weights, not as high as those uh, exercises, but uh, much faster speeds here, therefore much higher power outputs. All right, so um, throwing power out there a lot, uh, saying it's high power output, but at what what percentage do do you see this power output occur? Um, it's been it's pretty wide range. 60 to 80 percent of the one rep max on say a clean has been shown to be uh, the highest power level for that athlete. It's very dependent on the individual. So I might, my power output, peak power might occur at 65%, but another athlete might be 78%. It depends on a lot of things. Um, their training level, what their experience doing, um, what they've been doing in their training recently. Um, but that's a broad range uh, to give you an idea. Olympic lifts can also help increase rate of force development, highly related to power, but it's that ability to generate force quickly um, from a dead stop. So peak RFD has been seen to occur at 70% of one RM, 
and this relates highly to sports such as with football linemen coming off that line being able to explode quickly into their opponent. If they're able to develop more force more quickly, uh, they're going to beat that guy across the line. Uh, and it occurs in other sports as well, not necessarily just contact sports like football. If you're a soccer player and you're in a dead position or you're a goalkeeper, you need to explode and react to um, a shot or react to a player moving. That rate of force development is going to help you do that more quickly. Okay. So deceleration, I think this is a benefit of Olympic weightlifting or weightlifting in general that is often overlooked. Uh, Receiving the bar is basically an eccentric contraction. You have to use your agonist muscles to absorb the force from that bar. Uh, gravity is pretty strong. That bar is coming back down on you pretty fast. So we need to be able to absorb that weight, stop it, and stand back up, or it's going to be a failed lift. Um, and the benefits of that for sports training are pretty obvious, I think. Uh, we, it's been getting more popular talking about the eccentric force, portions of lifts. Uh, developing eccentric strength to help uh, with change of direction or absorbing forces from jumps. It's the same sort of thing from Olympic lifting. Um, overcoming the barbell movement uh, is actually, you see a greater impulse there than you would in just a normal front squat or a back squat because that weight is moving so fast. So the catch is similar to ground based, uh, the demands of ground based athletes. Uh, landing from jumps such as basketball players, change the direction on the field, from football, soccer, lacrosse. As you can see, this athlete here has just changed direction and he's coming out of the cut. Uh, so what he did, I'm going to plant, absorb that force. Obviously, it's my body weight with the velocity that I'm traveling at. Absorb that force and I want to be able to explode in the other way. And that's why catching a bar, receiving that bar, helps you absorb that force gives you more eccentric strength so that you can uh, better change direction um, in your respective sports. Um, also, absorbing forces from collisions. Uh, some ways this might help. Obviously, if you're jumping up and bumping into somebody, doesn't really apply. But maybe uh, football players running into each other, you absorb that force, come back down, and then are able to uh, reapply. So getting into kind of how the movements are similar, uh, this is kinematically and kinetically, um, snatch and clean and tension would be very similar to that of the vertical jump. And using that as an example, uh, it's been shown you, as your snatch ability increases or your clean ability, the vertical jump will increase. And kind of the reason for that is that they the Olympic lifts use a stretch shortening cycle, much like Elliot was talking about, use the elastic component of muscle. And to kind of explain that, I'll put these two pictures up here. I'll talk about just the top one uh, first. You can't really see the numbers on the, I'm just going to talk about the knee angle here. So in one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to eight, through one to three, the knee angle is getting larger. So we have 80, 84, 132. Then at four, it actually drops back down to 113. And the reason that's important is there's, they call it the slight rebend of the knees when you're performing the Olympic lifts. So if you're, I'm not going to use the barbell here, but you're extending up, you get past those knees, those knees rebend, and that's where that stretch shortening cycle happens. It's a slight eccentric force and translated into the concentric, which the, uh, Elliot was talking about, using the elastic component, and that's very similar to a vertical jump, where you get that little rebend and explode up. Uh, basically, that happens at the transition from the first to the second pull, and as you remember, the second pull is where that highest power output is seen throughout the whole thing. So a lot of research has been done as far as vertical jump goes in the Olympic clips. Uh, Canavan, Garrett, and Armstrong found that kinetically the hang snatch and the vertical jump were very similar. Athletes that had peak power, high power outputs in the vertical jump had high power outputs in the hang snatch, and they kind of went hand in hand. So max power was similar, time to max power was similar, everything in that uh, kind of range was similar between those two movements. Um, and another 
another study comparing Olympic weightlifters, power lifters, and uh, sprinters. Olympic lifters and sprinters were found to be the most powerful athletes, which that's not too surprising because they're the ones who need to run fast and lift uh, heavy weight very quickly. Olympic lifters were also significantly stronger than the sprinters, um, and they were seen to be the most powerful overall. So you can see that these athletes are using these uh, movements every day. They're becoming very powerful um, and relatively strong as well. Power lifters were the strongest, but that's what they're expected to do. They just couldn't move those weights at as high speed um, as the others. So getting on to the last uh, main reason for using these lifts, motor learning and motor control. So you can you can increase coordination of the muscle groups by utilizing the Olympic lifts, increase balance and flexibility if they're used in the correct way through full range of motion, increase activation of fast twitch fibers at a submaximal intensity, so you're generating more force at a submaximal intensity. Um, obviously, that's going to encourage you to get stronger as well. Similar motor patterning to other movements, like I said, similar to jumps, change of direction, things of that nature. And uh, just adding complex skills such as the clean and the snatch um, and the jerk to your repertoire of skills is going to make you a better athlete. You have uh, a bigger uh, physical ability spectrum that you can hopefully translate into the field of play. And just some additional benefits. It's actually, you would look at somebody performing the, the snatch or you watch it on the Olympics and someone has a horrific injury, drops the bar on their head, like shatters an elbow, things of that nature. There's actually very low incidence of injury in uh, weightlifting. And it's lower than lifting weights, like powerlifting. It's lower than any sport out there, and especially the team sport. Uh, <coughs> catches needs to be done correctly. Um, it'll improve lean body mass and bone mineral density and also have a positive influence on your neuroendocrine system, uh, setting up an environment for you to get bigger, get stronger, and uh, hopefully see those translations onto the, onto the field of court. All right. All right, so now I'm going to get into some of the teaching progressions uh, that I use. Um, and have used in the past, kind of based my uh, philosophy off USA Weightlifting's top-down approach. And the reason I go this route is to start at the power position. It's the most simple of the positions, but you can still get benefits of using the lift um, from, from that position. And also, um, working from the power position can help kind of head off some of the common errors that I'll talk about later by starting at that position, they learn the simplest movements first and then don't have those errors later on as the lifts get more technical. So I'm going to have Narcisa come up here. <laughs> Narcisa agreed to be our model here for our Olympic lifts. So start off with the bar. I'm going to start with the clean. Oh, okay. So prerequisites, I believe, are front squat and RDL. I'm not going to make you do those, but we've seen with the front squat and RDL from uh, Coach Anthony's uh, presentation both work. But I think those are prerequisites to doing the Olympic lifts just because they're found, um, especially the clean, they're found within that movement. And you'll kind of see why as we go. But first thing I'm going to have him do, first uh, position that we'll we will have is the power position clean pull. So go ahead and address the bar and pick it up. And you'll see, go ahead, just, just stand up. Just hold on to it. Hold on. Yeah. All right, so can everybody see him? All right. Uh, power position clean pull. So as you, uh, can we go back to the previous slide? This, this athlete uh, is power position right there, and his chest is straight up, he's sitting right at the top of the thigh, that's it. Maybe I have to turn around face that way too. Face oh, this way, you yeah. see your chest better that way. Yeah. That'll work. Uh, go ahead. So, power position, clean pull, he's going to slightly bend the knees, chest going to stay right up, 
go ahead and get in that power position. So hold on, hold on. Not the start position, we want to be in the power position. Top of the pie a little. Right there. So see, he's more vertical. And this is just before that triple extension is occurring. And this is where I stop, uh, start teaching the athletes. I'm going to have him just do a clean pull, which is just a powerful shrug with the jump. So go ahead, jump and shrug. Okay, go ahead and set it down. All right, so he's showing that full, full motion. And uh, what I want you to do this time is just start from that power position right here. Straight up and shrug. Good. One more time. Good. You can go ahead and set the bar down for a second. So here, that's that power position. Starting tall, just extend it. So as, we're, as I said, it's the top-down approach. You're starting from that top position, extend it up. So next, we'll go to a power position, power clean. So I'm going to want him to start from the exact same position. So we're going to throw that catch into it now. Can you bottom one? Yes, sir. And before I have you do this, um, obviously, within one workout, you have an athlete, you're starting them right away. You're not going to follow through this whole progression. It's over time. I'm just taking you through kind of these certain points in the progression. Um, when, you, when you advance through the progression, would obviously depend on the proficiency of the athlete and when they're kind of ready to go to the next step. We're going to go to the power position with the catch now. Good. And now he's cleaning it up, lands right on the shoulders, has those elbows nice and hot. Good. All right, now we're going to a hang clean above the knee. Very good. And now notice one thing that is incorporated here now is that RDL motion. So he's starting from that power position, he's almost an RDL down, then he explodes up catches it in that power position, or power clean position. All right, now power, hang power clean below the knee. So this adds complexity to the lift, makes you re-bend the knees, stretch shortening cycles utilized, and go ahead. Good, one more. And I know it's hard to notice that re bend of the knee, but it is occurring as he passes that knee, those knees re-bend, and he extends powerfully up towards the lift up towards the ceiling. Um, not gonna, well, let's go ahead and do a lift off. So go ahead down to the ground. Lift off, I don't have it exactly in the progression, but it's something you can work work on when you're starting to go below the knee, helping bridge the gap between um, pain cleans and cleans from the floor. So lift off, he's gonna set in that good position, back flat, shoulders directly over the bar. And he's really just gonna lift that bar to just below the knee. And then you could have them as well of doing anything from the floor of the knee. So you see how that connection can be made. And now, do a full power clean from the ground. Good. And obviously, full clean would be the last in the progression, and as you will remember, uh, that's catching below parallel. So go ahead and do one full clean. So you see, that's the basic progression that I follow, and that might take uh, a semester with some athletes. It might take years with others. Um, for example, the soccer team that I worked with at Valdosta, uh, I got to hang hang cleans above the knee. I was there for a year and a half, and that's about as far as we got. Uh, so it just kind of depends on who you're working with and how far they advance and what their capabilities are. Right. So going to the jerk, a little bit shorter of a progression. We have the military press. I'm going to drive that bar again. Military press, just an overhead press. This is what I'm going to start with. This helps develop that overhead uh, strength, strengthen the shoulders, and just the ability to stabilize that bar overhead because this is where you're going to end up. Then we have a push press where you start to incorporate the legs, but it still has a strong shoulder component. It's a dip and drive. There's no rebend in the knee. So notice how he dips down, extends up, and his knee stays straight once he extends. Um, then we have a power jerk and making it a little more 
complicated, able to lift a little more weight with this exercise. Um, you're going to dip, drive, and then drop back under the bar as you catch it. Okay. Notice how he re-bent. He's in kind of a power position in an overhead. And last, uh, last stage in the progression would be a split jerk. And this is where you land in that split position that you saw earlier when, when I introduced the lifts. Notice he shot this deep uh, out. One foot goes forward, one comes back, then he recovers. Let's go a little more. Go ahead and put that bar down. We can roll that out of the way. And let's go this next one. Alright. So going into the snatch, um, what I usually do is teach the snatch after. Uh, the clean if I get there. Uh, I think it's easier if the athletes already learned the clean. It's a little less technical and what I've noticed is snatch is picked up a lot more quickly if they already are able to perform the clean. Um, we'll start some, or you might start some of the uh, foundational exercises earlier on such as the press behind the neck. So go ahead and just get in a squat position. He's just gonna start with the well, not not all the way, just like a, you just unracked it. Uh, narrow those hands up. Oh. No, no, narrow, narrow, narrow. There you go. Starting with the, basically a military press. You know, press above the neck, press above the head. That's the first one. Just getting used to that movement. Then you can go to a snatch press behind the neck. So just get that wide grip, pressing overhead. Go ahead and give me a couple overhead squats next. Good. And those are all kind of just foundational exercises for the snatch. The snatch balance is where it starts to uh, get closer closer to the actual movement, to the actual lift. So go ahead and perform a snatch balance. You'll see it's kind of like a power jerk combined with that snatch grip. Go ahead. Good. You see, dips, drives, and drops into that overhead squat. So making it a little bit more holistic, uh, your body now has to deal with catching that bar overhead. And then from there, going to a power position snap. So just like the clean, starting in that power position, so now the bar is being lifted directly from that position to overhead. Okay. And then we'll work our way down. We'll make Narciso go through the whole thing. The progression is pretty much the same. Um, from there, going to above the knee, below the knee, you can practice lift-offs, um, and everything is, is pretty much the same, um, all the way to that full snatch, dropping into a full overhead position. I don't know, so I think you're good. Man. Appreciate it. Everyone, give a round of So now, now that you know kind of the progression of teaching, um, it's important to know some of the errors you might run into. Um, and I, I won't keep our system up here going through making him manipulate himself into a bunch of crazy positions as errors. But uh, first one is pulling with the arms too early. And as I don't know if you can tell, but the Olympic lifts are primarily a lower body uh, movement. That's where you're developing that power. That's really what we're trying to target as far as sports performance goes. Um, but if you pull with the arms too early, some of the possible causes would be uh, elbows being behind the bar when you start. So just to give you an idea of what that would look like. If an athlete's lining up with the bar, starting with those elbows behind, that bar might be out ahead of, ahead of them. And as you can see, my elbows are behind that bar. And that can create a problem. Um, might not be producing enough force from the legs, and it could be a timing issue. So, and let me, I'll give you one example of um, pulling with the arms too early, not getting everything out of the legs that you want, kind of like so. And if you notice, before I get to this full extension, I'm going to start with those arms, and that's kind of the error that I'm talking about. Um, indications of this error, bar might travel away from the body. 
uh, bar not, might not be pulled high enough to get a good catch, uh, which could lead to some other errors that I'll actually talk about. And some of the corrections that you might use, reinforcing with pulls, the clean pulls at the beginning of the progressions. Uh, you can do snatch pulls as well. Not something I had in that snatch progression um, because of when I teach it, but something that you can add in. The same thing as the clean pull, which is the jump and throw, except you're in that snatch position. A um, good cue is to say arms straight or arms, arms locked out. Right. Uh, another error, hips rising before, uh, or hips rise before the chest when lifting from the floor. So here, the error that I'm talking about is after there are athletes in this set position, those hips go up first and then the chest. So you can see it's kind of like a wave-like motion hips going before the chest. What you want to see is that nice smooth extension up off the ground where the torso angle stays the same until you're passing the knee and that chest starts to rise to get the full extension. Um, possible causes here, just the athletes rushing to start. They're trying too quickly to put that torsion to the ground and it causes those hips to go up. Low back might not be held tight, might be breaking, they might have weakness in their low back causing kind of a here. Indications of this error, a uh, bar might be swinging away from the body again. Uh, athlete might have to jump forward to catch the bar. And uh, also, they might have low back pain or strain. Just kind of some things that you can look for to know if that's the reason. Um, even though it is pretty easy to notice that when walking. Corrections, uh, the liftoffs I think is a great one to work, uh, work on this, connecting those two errors. We're connecting those two movements. Uh, lower back strengthening is going to help them if it's a weakness problem. And setting eyes in a neutral position. Sometimes you'll see athletes line up to the bar and looking kind of straight down here. And that's when that head is tucked a little further down, they're going to tend to lift those hips up first. So you want to be in a neutral position looking a little bit ahead of you on the ground. And that might help keep them locked into place. And then uh, some cues that you can give or, or maybe, I wouldn't say a cue, but more an explanation to get them thinking about it as having that chest up or hips and chest rising together. Alright, All right, catching with the feet out wide. This is a pretty easy one to see. And what I mean by this is in that catch, athletes are jumping their feet way up here. And this can be a problem. It's not a very athletic position. Um, and it's hard if you start moving a lot of weight to sit low and catch that much. Uh, so it's definitely a problem, not the best position to be in for executing these lifts. Um, some possible causes would be missing full extension. They don't get that bar high enough, so they have to shoot those feet out real quick to be able to catch it. Um, might pull too early with the arms, which kind of goes, in, goes into account with missing full extension, not getting full power. Uh, cuts off the power, and they have to real quick get those legs out. Flexibility could be an issue. Maybe they can't sit down to a front squat position. So instead of doing, instead of catching here, they get that to get uh, get out wider and to get lower to catch the bar. And same kind of thing, inability to sit to catch. Indications of this error, um, like I said, it's pretty easy to see. They're out in that wide position. And corrections, uh, improving strength in the squat. I should say, improving strength and mobility in the squat position, front squat position, um, and overhead squat position. Utilizing combo movements such as a power clean. If your athlete power cleans and jumps out here, have them step in and go into a front squat. And I think over time, as they practice that movement, they'll figure out, hey, if I stomp my feet down under me right here rather than just going out wide, be able to sit right into that front squat. It saves me some time. Uh, that's kind of the idea behind it. And some cues that I use are stomp your feet under you or uh, quick feet and get a big jump because if that extension's full, then they have time to get those feet under. All right, another error, having a poor catch or a rack position. And what I'm talking about um, with the rack position is that front squat position once it's caught. So a lot of times you'll see athletes here not able to rest the bar on their shoulders. They're catching it kind of in their hands or down here. Elbows aren't up. Um, there's 
all kinds of combinations that can be had. But we want those elbows up, resting in the hands, but not they don't have a death grip on the bar. We want that contact in the shoulders. So if they're here and resting in the hands or elbows are down, um, that's the kind of error that I'm talking about. So possible causes, catching it in the hands. Um, a lot of athletes, especially getting new to the lifts, aren't comfortable getting it directly to the shoulders. They think they have to catch it in the hands. It's kind of a natural, natural thing to want to catch it in the hands rather than letting that slip on your shoulders. Um, might have an insufficient pull, not getting the bar high enough, so they have to catch it here and then maybe move into that position rather than snap right into it. It could be a flexibility issue. Their wrist might not bend that way. Their shoulders might be inflexible. Their lats are tight. They can't get those elbows up. Um, and they might just have, like I said, the confidence might not be there. They're unable to get into that correct position. Um, indications, catching in the hands, elbows pointing down, and the bar not in contact with the shoulders. And some corrections, I think demonstrating and practicing getting into that rack position, especially with maybe light weight, or as light a weight as you can, um, just so they get comfortable quickly getting into that position. Also, if it's a flexibility or mobility issue, uh, you got to work on those so that they can't correctly uh, get into the position. Because that is one of the, this error is one of the um, leading, uh, leading determinants of the weight that you can lift. Maybe not determinant, but it'll hold an athlete back if they can't catch it correctly. Uh, they won't be able to maximize their weight. Uh, for example, I've uh, seen linemen clean about 315 pounds, catch it in their hands here, and they probably could clean close to 400 if they could do it correctly. But they're catching it in their hands. You can only hold so much weight right here. So your, your uh, spine's a lot stronger, or your torso is a lot stronger holding that weight to get it in the correct position. All right, so are these lifts for everybody? Um, or all athletes, I would say probably not. There's certain way, certain people that shouldn't perform them, at least the strict um, Olympic or weightlifting um, versions. Maybe some variations would help. But so for limited, those with limited mobility, such as shoulder mobility, um, this athlete in the picture is attempting an overhead squat. That's the best position he can get in. It's probably not a good idea to load him up and have him do full snatches because he can't get the weight in overhead position. That's just waiting for, for an injury. If there's going to be an increased risk of injury if the correct positions of these lifts can't be obtained. Um, you could use a variation for him, though. Maybe he's doing just a snatch high pull, which you just don't catch in an overhead position. You grab here, pull that high. We're still getting the triple extension and power development. Um, but you're not putting him at increased risk for injury. Uh, somebody with limited hip mobility might not be able to sit into a full front squat, but you can do the power position or power versions of those lifts and still get benefits. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, tall athletes, um, thinking about your seven foot uh, basketball players, six foot five basketball players, football players, often very tall, might have a hard time getting into this start position. It's easy for a short guy like me to get down here ready to perform a lift. But those athletes are very tall. You're going to look at them and they have a hard time getting down um, into this position. So maybe use blocks for them to raise it up, make it more uh, biomechanically sound uh, so that they can get in the correct starting position and then successfully perform that lift. Uh, overhead athletes, such as baseball players, volleyball players, uh, softball, uh, something that I've been kicking around in my training because of training the softball team here. I haven't utilized any Olympic lifting as of now. Um, might do so in the fall. But something you have to consider is the shoulder. And they're spending all their time uh, throwing, particularly on one shoulder. Um, in a certain study, 61% of baseball pitchers and 47% of uh, position players were shown to have shoulder instability. So is it worth the risk um, to perform the Olympic lifts, such as a snatch, which is a movement?
movement that requires a lot of shoulder stability if they're already unstable on the shoulder. Uh, it's kind of something you have to decide. I've heard of baseball strength coaches utilizing the snatch, so it's not like it's never been done. You've got to decide on your own if that's something you want to do. Also, in rotational sports, um, the Olympic lifts don't directly relate to those sports, so getting more powerful in Olympic lifts won't necessarily make you pitch faster or make you more effective in that rotational uh, movement. And, but maybe you use variations such as pulls and high pulls. Uh, drop pulls are one that I see with baseball and softball uh, athletes a lot. It's where you perform that lift, such as, a, such as a high pull, and then just drop the weight. Then you're not even catching or having any, any eccentric force on the shoulder. Um, obviously, it's going to reduce the risk of injury pretty drastically. Uh, problem I see with that is you're not going to have the eccentric force, the whole deceleration of benefit that I was talking about uh, is taken away, but you can still develop power and add skills to that athlete. Um, also, non-ground-based athletes, and I'm thinking swimmers, rowers, uh, those kind of athletes, often many water sports, is it worth the time and effort to teach them these lifts? Because as you see, there's long progressions, might take a while, and there's a very small part, if any, of their sport that requires that triple extension. So is it worth taking the time to uh, develop these skills if they're not really using them on the sport? You have to do kind of a needs analysis and decide for yourself if it's something you want to take the time to teach your athletes. All right, just kind of a sample workout here and some suggestions that I have if you're going to implement these. Uh, pretty basic workout. Uh, as you'll see, the Olympic lifts are utilized early in the workout, first exercise. Uh, so day one, for example, is power clean, then back squat, RDL, one arm row, and uh, some kind of abs, whatever you want to do. Uh, typically with the Olympic lifts, you use sets of five reps or less. You don't want to go much higher than that because they are very technical, and once you start moving up in weight, um, power exercises usually are two to three exercise, uh, two to three reps uh, at the most. So five is probably pushing the limit. Um, let technique run the session, not the numbers, because they are so technical. Technique starts to break down. That's where that increased uh, risk of en injury uh, occurs if they're not able to control the weight and things like that. And just kind of to wrap up, uh, the Olympic lifts are great tools to have in your toolbox. Um, you shouldn't have your athletes doing that all day, every day. If you're trying to train them for their sport, uh, it's just something to add to what you're already doing. Progression and technique are very important. And remember that power position you're going to get benefits from. So you don't have to rush through, uh, rush through the progression to get to the floor, performing that whole, uh, whole sequence, whole technical lift, because you can still get the, get the benefits from a simpler part of the progression. And the reason I bring that up is sometimes you won't get the same benefits, whether it's power output or deceleration, things of that nature, if they're not doing that lift technically sound. Um, so it's good to take your time, get the benefits while you can at each stage, but make sure they're doing it correctly. Uh, things to consider if you're talking about putting this uh, into your programming, do a needs analysis on the sport. Do you need it? Are there any uh, indications why you shouldn't use them or use certain variations. So does the athlete have any past injuries? Do they have any mobility or stability issues? Um, what's their training age or their experience? Um, because I don't, I don't think that you necessarily need to say, oh, this athlete's 10 years old, they can't Olympic lift. I don't think there's age classifications, but your, your reasoning and maybe your goals of those programs might be different. And uh, are you comfortable teaching the lifts? If you can't perform the lifts and teach them to somebody, or don't feel comfortable teaching them to somebody else, uh, you have no business trying to implement them in your programs. So do a little bit of research. Take a, a USAW course. Um, there's all kinds of resources, and we'd be happy to share some with you. Uh, but make sure you're comfortable teaching those lifts. And just. One thing I think always needs to be there in our field is more research and um, 
with Olympic lifts, definitely would like to see some more, such as compa comparison of Olympic lifts to other strength speed movements, such as speed squats, weighted jumps, things that are uh, common in what Joey was talking about with the conjugate system. Uh, which one's more effective? Are they equally effective? Uh, that's something I would like to know. At what percentages exactly do you develop power? Because I gave you that range of where peak power is, but do you operate right at that number, your peak power, to get better? Uh, do you just have to get stronger to develop that? Um, how does that work? Some research could be done there. And then also maybe a direct relationship between running, cutting, and things of that nature. There's been a lot of research with vertical jump, but how does the, how does the Olympic lifts directly correlate with those movements? All right. And just some references. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And I appreciate your time.